The Girl in the Lavender Dress, retold by Maureen Scott. My grandmother was, I always believed, a truthful woman. She paid her taxes, she went to church, she considered the Lord's business as her own. When her children told lies, they soon saw the light of truth. They went to bed without any supper, the taste of soap still pungent on their tongues. That's why the story that follows bothers me so much. It just can't be true. Of course, Grandma was 92 when she told it to me, and her mind had started to fail. She might have really believed it. Who knows? Maybe you will, too. I'll try to tell the story just the way she told it to me. She was in a nursing home then. It was late at night, and the two of us were alone in the TV room. Grandma's eyelids hung low over her eyes. She worked her wrinkled jaw a few times and began. It all happened about 42 or 43, Grandma said. It was during World War II. We didn't have much gas in those days. No one did. So whenever Herbert took the car somewhere, I tried to go along for the ride. We lived in Vermont in those days. This time I'm thinking of, Herbert had some business in Claremont. That's in New Hampshire, just across the river. Well, seems Herbert had saved up the gas to go by car, about 25 miles. He said we could leave after work Friday. That night we'd have us a good restaurant meal. Maybe see a movie, too. Then we'd stay in a hotel and drive back the next day. I don't remember the month exactly. Sometime in the fall, because it was cool. It was a misty night. I remember Herbert had to keep the wipers going. And it was after dusk when we first saw her. I know it was dark, because I remember first seeing her in the lights ahead. Neither Herbert nor I spoke. He slowed down, and the girl stopped walking. She just stood there on our side of the road, not hitching exactly, but she sure looked like she wanted a ride. It was a lonely road, and there weren't many cars. First, Herbert passed her, going real slow. Then he backed up to where she was. I rolled down my window. She was a pretty little thing, about 18 or 20, a round face and big round eyes, brown hair cut straight. The mist kind of made her face shine. But the funny thing was that she was wearing only a thin lavender party dress. In that weather. Well, I don't remember that anybody did any asking. I just opened the door and leaned forward. She climbed into the back seat and Herbert started up again. Finally, I asked her where she was going. Claremont. That was all she said at first. She had a light, breathless voice, like... It took a whole lungful of air to say that one word. You're lucky, Herbert said. We're going all the way. The girl didn't reply. We rode on a little ways. I turned around once or twice, but the girl just smiled, sort of sadly. Anyhow, I didn't want to stare at her. But who was she? And why was she walking on a lonely road at night? I've never been the kind to go pry into other people's business. So what I did then was, well... I'd taken off my sweater when the car got warm. I offered it to her, and she put it on. The mist turned to light rain. Just before we got to the river, Herbert broke the silence. Where are you going in Claremont, miss? There was no reply. It's coming on to rain, Herbert said, and we got time to deliver you. Oh, the girl breathed. Could you really? That would be... That would be nice. To my parents' house? Corner of Bond and Mason? Claremont must be a nice place to grow up, I said, but again there was no sound from the back of the car. You couldn't even hear her breathing. I just settled back into my seat and enjoyed the trip. We crossed the bridge, headed into town, and Herbert turned right onto Bond Street. We rode along, looking at the street signs. Mason was way out. There was only one house on the corner, on the opposite side. Herbert made a U-turn and stopped the car. There was no one in the rear seat. I looked at Herbert. He looked at me, his eyes popping. I pulled myself up so I could see the back floor. Nothing. Just a little wetness where her feet had been. Where'd she get out? Herbert asked. At a stoplight? I wondered. But we both knew it couldn't be. It was a two-door car, so we'd know if a door opened. Both of us looked at the rear windows. They were closed, as they had been. 
Neither of us had felt a draft. Yet there had to be some explanation. Come, Herbert said. We hurried toward the house. It was a big square, box-like building. Lights were on in nearly every room. Splotches of brightness covered the lawn. The door had a name on it, J.R. Bullard. It was opened by a long-faced man, about fifty. "'Excuse me,' Herbert said, "'but there seems to be some mystery. "'You see, your daughter—' "'Daughter?' said the man. "'Why, we don't have any daughter.' A small woman, some years younger now, stood at his side. "'Well,' Herbert began. "'We did have a daughter,' the woman said. "'But Carol is deceased, you see.' She was buried in Calhoun Cemetery four months ago. Herbert gripped my arm. We both knew Calhoun Cemetery. It was on the Vermont side of the river. Then who, Herbert wondered aloud. Suddenly he looked embarrassed. Excuse me, he muttered. It's all a, a mistake. Just a minute, I said. Would you mind telling us what Carol looked like? The couple exchanged glances. If they were worried, it wasn't about Carol, it was about us. A little on the short side, the woman said almost to herself. A round face, big round eyes, dark straight hair, cut in bangs. Herbert's hand was a lobster claw on my elbow. We excused ourselves in a hurry. Back in the car, we sped away through the night. Then we drove around for a long time, looking. Across the bridge, down every little road back into Claremont, near every stoplight, along Bond Street. But we both knew the search was futile. There was only one answer. What we'd had in our car, sitting on the back seat and even talking, was the ghost of Carol Bullard. And the amazing thing was, was that we had proof. A ghost, you see, cannot cross water. That was why, when we came to the river, the ghost had only one choice to disappear. Grandma stopped talking, and I thought that was the end of her incredible story. But no, there was more. And that isn't all, Grandma went on. That night, the night that it happened, we were both pretty edgy, didn't get much sleep either. Not till the next morning did we think of my sweater. It had disappeared with the ghost. That was a really good sweater, almost new. You see, we didn't have much money, and it was wartime. Clothes were hard to come by. But once in a while, I'd blow a week's pay on something really nice, something that would last for years, like that sweater. Now listen, it's like this. On the way home, we thought we'd swing around by Calhoun Cemetery. We wanted to find a certain gravestone, the one that would say Carol Bullard on it. So we did just that. It took a long time, but finally we found the new graves. And there, at last, was the stone. A small flat stone, just Carol Bullard on it. No dates, nothing more. But next to the stone, neatly folded up, was my sweater. True or not? You decide.